So now that we've learned about the distribution of means, I want to show you how we would apply that to a sample Z inferential test. It's going to be very much like the individual Z test. We just have to change our math a little bit. And so instead of looking at an individual, this time we're going to do the six steps to look at a sample of people. So let's do that with a fun example. Dr. Dam saw 25 of her students in line for Rise of the Resistance at Disneyland. She wondered if they'd be better able to answer statistics questions because they seemed so relaxed and happy. She gave them a pop quiz and they scored an average of 76%. Dr. Dam's class averages 74% with a standard deviation of 6%. Do the six steps to inferential statistics to see if standing in line makes students perform differently on statistics questions. All right, so we are going to go through our six steps just like we did before. Um, we're going to write our research question, make sure it's written in the present tense. We're going to do a question that's really a yes, no type of question. Then we're going to write our null and our alternative. We're going to make sure that the null really is about no difference. We're going to define our rejection region. We're going to calculate our z-score, which has changed just a little bit now. We have an extra math step to do. And then we're going to decide about the null, either reject it or fail to reject it. And then we'll make a conclusion to call grandma up and tell her about what we found. So we have everything we need to start our research question. And if you remember, it said the last line said, do the six steps to inferential statistics to see if standing in line makes students perform differently on statistics questions. So really, I just did a copy paste here and turned that into a question does standing in line make students perform differently on statistics questions? Now, before I move on, I want to point out a few things about this. Notice that I didn't use the past tense did. I didn't say did standing in line make students perform differently. And that's because past tense would suggest that I'm only interested in that one instantiation. But inferential statistics is kind of a more generalized perspective. So we're going to just say does standing in line, not really um, talking about this one case. Notice that I didn't say, do the 25 students uh, perform differently? I am not doing this to talk only about 25 students. I'm doing this to infer to the larger world. Do all students who stand in line perform differently on statistics questions? And notice that Dr. Dam had the idea that students might perform better because they look relaxed and happy, but that wasn't sufficient justification to do a one-tailed test. So all researchers have hunches. They do believe in something. Um, so all of their ideas may be one-tailed, but you can only do a one-tailed test if you have previous literature to justify doing that. So you want to make sure that you don't confuse the researchers hypothesis with what they're justified in doing whether a one-tailed or two-tailed test. So even though Dr. Dam is quite intelligent, she can't make a one-tailed test based on just her assumptions alone. So this one's going to stay two-tailed and the question is going to say does standing in line make students perform differently on statistics questions. So now we have what we need to set up our hypotheses. I like to set up my alternative first because it's kind of just a copy paste. So we went from does standing in line make students perform differently on statistics questions, we could say standing in line makes students perform differently on statistics questions. I could also set this up with symbols. You don't have to do both, but I just wanted to show you. So the, this would be the mu of line people, that L stands for those in line. The mu of those in line is not the same as the mu for all of her classes, so it does not equal to. And then we can add the word not to fill out our null. So our null says standing in line does not make students perform differently on statistics questions. And then if we were to write this out with symbols, it would say mu of the line people. <laughs> that sounds funny. Mu of those in line would be the same as the mu for the um, class average. In other words, they're, they're not different. All right, so we have our step one and our step two. Now let's talk about step three. Now I established early on it was two-tailed. We knew that because it had the word differently in there and that's a two-tailed word. So we could write this out as more than 1.96 or less than negative 1.96 is our rejection region. I like to put it in a picture. And so the reason I like pictures is because whenever we calculate our z-score, we can see where it goes. And I like to mark the region with RR, rejection region. Therefore, I don't forget what happens when you land there. If the score lands here, we, we are going to reject the null. If the score lands up here, we're going to reject the null. So those are the rejection regions. 
any score that falls in this white zone in between, we're going to fail to reject the null. So we've established this before we've done any math. Now we're going to do some math, and let's do that together. I'm just going to pause. So here you can see I've copied and pasted just a section of that prompt. So we had everything we needed to get the numbers we wanted. And here it says she gave them a pop quiz and they scored an average of 76%. Dr. Dam's class averages 74% with a standard deviation of 6%. So we have everything we needed. Actually, the only thing I'm missing is, sorry, let me get rid of that, is the sample size. So the sample size in this case was 25. So remember that the way we calculate our z-score is we take our sample mean minus the population mean. Now remember, before it was your score minus the mean. Well now our score is the sample mean. So we have to kind of, it's a little bit more complicated, but not too bad. And then we're going to divide by the standard deviation just like we did before, but we have the additional step of dividing by the square root of n. I always suggest to students that they do this in um, kind of a systematic process. You can't enter these into a calculator by x bar minus mu divided by standard deviation. You can't do it in that order. You have to follow the rule order of operations. So I tell students to solve from the bottom up whenever possible. So let's go ahead and, and at least fill this out. So we know that the z equals, and we have to see from the story, what is our x bar? So for a moment, take a look and see what you think the sample mean is. And hopefully you identify that that was 76%. Um, Sometimes students mix up the mu and the x bar, so you want to make sure you can identify that from the storyline. And then I now know the mu is 74%, and I can see the standard deviation is 6%, so I'm almost done. Um, and then I know my sample size was 25 from the story, so I have to do the square root of 25. Now, even though I'm dealing with percents, I didn't have to do 0.76 minus 0.74 divided by 0.06, um, you could have, you just want to make sure you stay consistent throughout, but we didn't really need to do that step. Um, we can just leave it as 76 and 74 and that kind of thing. So again, I recommend that you solve from the bottom up. So the square root of um, 25 is a nice nine round five. I did that on purpose. So that's going to be six divided by five. And we can go ahead and make sure that we know that 76 minus 74 is two. So now I know that I have to do 6 divided by 5. And just to make sure I do it right, I'm going to use my calculator. And it came out to be 1.2. So I'm just going to put this down here. That's going to be 2 divided by 1.2. So I hope you see what I've done is I solved this piece separately and put it down here. I, I know I'm belaboring the point, but most errors I see in which students don't calculate this right are because they try to blast through these calculations really fast and they don't slow down and make sure that they've calculated them right. So if I look at my trusty calculator then and say 2 divided by 1.2, I get a 1.66666, or I can round that to 1.67. So what I can see here then is my z is 1.67, and that's what I need to move forward in finishing up my six steps to inferential statistics. Let me do that now. So now that we have done the math, let's see what steps we've been able to finish up. So we asked, does standing in line make students perform differently on statistics questions? We set up our null and alternative hypothesis. So the null is standing in line does not make students perform differently. And the alternative is that standing in line makes students perform differently. We figured out our rejection region where I like to draw it, more than 1.96 or less than negative 1.96 is my rejection region. And then we just calculated that our z-score was 1.67. So you can think about 1.67 is roughly going to be in this white zone. So if it's in that white area there, then we know we are going to have to fail to reject the null. So if we fail to reject the null, remember we always assume the null to be true. So if I fail to reject it, then I have to use that as my conclusion. So I'm going to call up grandma and say, standing in line does not make students perform differently 
on statistics questions. So you can see here on this page, we have all six steps set up. Um, and the really the only thing that changed was our step four. We had to add that square root of 25 in the denominator. Now, I know here we failed to reject the null, so I just wanted to show you what it would look like if I mixed things up a little bit where we ended up rejecting the null. So here I took the same story, but maybe they changed it for their in line for coffee. So there's 25 students in line for coffee and they scored an average of 79%. Dr. Dam's class average is 74% with standard deviation of 6%. Do the six steps to inferential statistics to see if standing in line for coffee makes students perform differently on statistics questions. So you notice everything's really the same. The only thing I really changed here was the they're standing in line for coffee instead of the ride, but um, I changed this number to 79%. So let's see how this would look now that I've changed that one thing. My research question is, does standing in line for coffee make students perform differently? Notice that didn't change, even though my number changed, it didn't change my research question because my research question is not driven by my data, it is driven by the, the theory, the question. My null and alternative really much, pretty much stayed the same. I just added the in line for coffee, but other than that, they stayed the same. My rejection region stayed the same, but now I'm going to have to do the math. And so um, I'm going to have you calculate the math and see if you get the same number I do. So you can pause this video real quick while you do the math and make sure to solve from the bottom up. Okay, I'm assuming you've unpaused. You want to see if you got the same number I did. I got now that I have a z-score, sorry, a, a new average of 79, I got a z-score of 4.17. So if I get a z-score of 4.17, that's going to be way up here. And since it's way up there, even though it looks like it's off the scale, remember this is asymptotic. It's theoretically never ending. So that 4.17 is still in the rejection region. So I'm going to reject the null. Ooh, that says fail to reject the null. Oh no. Let me see if I can uh, fix that real quick. Okay, with magic, I switched that. It now should say reject the null. And since I rejected the null, I cannot just say standing in line makes students perform differently because my grandma really would want to know if it hurts them or if it helps them. So you, when, because we see the z-score being at the upper tail, we want to make an upper tail conclusion and then say, Standing in line for coffee makes students perform better on statistics questions. So the reason I wanted to do this last step was to show you that the numbers dictated whether it was in the rejection region or not. Everything else pretty much stayed the same. And so if it's in the rejection region, it really changes what you do for step five and six. But other than that, all the steps stay the same for a sample Z as they would for an individual Z.